Chapter 3, we will review adrenergic pharmacology. In this figure, we look at the synthesis and release of norepinephrine. We will talk about the fates of norepinephrine once it's released from the neuron, and then we're going to look at a lot of different drugs that can interact and affect this pathway. In order to synthesize norepinephrine, we start with tyrosine. In fact, the conversion of tyrosine to dopa by the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase is the rate-limiting step in the synthesis of norepinephrine. It's always good to go back and reflect on other pathways that we've looked at. For example, when we look at acetylcholine synthesis, do you recall what the rate-limiting step was for the synthesis of acetylcholine? That's right, it was the uptake of choline. Here, it's the conversion of tyrosine to dopa by the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase. Dopa is then converted to dopamine by dopa decarboxylase. Dopamine is then converted to norepinephrine by dopamine beta hydroxylase. If you notice the box that's drawn around this reaction, that's because the, re the conversion of dopamine to norepinephrine takes place inside storage vesicles. That's a vesicular enzyme converting dopamine into norepinephrine. Now that we form norepinephrine, it will sit there in the vesicle until it's time to be released. The signal to release norepinephrine from the neuron, the membrane is going to depolarize, calcium channels open up, calcium rushes into the nerve, the vesicles fuse with the membrane, and norepinephrine gets released into the synapse. Once norepinephrine has been released, there are four things that you should identify that are going to happen. One of those things is norepinephrine diffuses across the synapse and binds to the postsynaptic receptor. This is an adrenergic nerve. Norepi is going to act on adrenergic receptors. Those can be either alpha or beta receptors of different types, again, depending on the organ that you're talking about. A second thing that can happen to norepinephrine, it can be metabolized by COMT. Catechol O-methyltransferase converts norepinephrine into inactive metabolites. And while that's an important reaction, that is not the most important reaction for limiting the actions of norepinephrine in the synapse. The way that you limit the action of norepinephrine in the synapse is rapid reuptake into the presynaptic nerve. If you follow this pathway on the left, norepinephrine is actively taken back up into this presynaptic neuron through a sodium potassium ATPase transporter. It's rapid reuptake into the presynaptic nerve that is the reason why norepinephrine has a short half-life. That distinguishes it from acetylcholine. Remember, it was the metabolism of acetylcholine by acetylcholinesterase. That was the reason why acetylcholine has a short half-life. We've just reviewed three things. Norepi binding to postsynaptic receptors, norepinephrine being metabolized by COMT, and rapid reuptake of norepinephrine into presynaptic nerves. What's the fourth thing? The fourth thing would, of course, be that norepinephrine can bind to presynaptic alpha-2 receptors. That is our negative feedback pathway. You remember, of course, that alpha-2 receptors are GI-coupled. They're inhibitory G proteins. When you stimulate alpha-2s, you see a decrease in cyclic AMP, and your calcium channels are going to close on the membrane. When calcium channels close, you can no longer fuse the vesicle with the membrane, and you inhibit neurotransmitter release. So in order to effectively describe how the drugs that affect this diagram work, you have to know what's going on normally with this type of neuron. When you look at the legend that's listed in the margin here of all the different drugs, I'm going to take those drugs and divide them into two categories. Certain drugs are going to increase the amount of norepinephrine in the synapse, whereas others are going to cause less norepinephrine in the synapse. Let's take the scenario of those causing more norepinephrine. The first drug we'll look at, labeled as number two, are the MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors like the drug phenylzine, block this enzyme. So what is the purpose of that enzyme? Well, it's found in the cytoplasm of these adrenergic nerves, and MAOA specifically is going to metabolize norepinephrine inside these nerves. If you think about it, when is MAOA 
going to ever be exposed to norepinephrine. Certainly in the process of reuptake back into the presynaptic nerve, norepinephrine is going to be free in the cytoplasm for a period of time. It's part of what we refer to as the mobile pool. When norepinephrine is being recycled on its way back into the storage vesicles, monoamine oxidase can metabolize it. It's going to limit how much norepinephrine goes back into the vesicle and therefore how much can be released. If a patient is taking a monoamine oxidase inhibitor and you block this enzyme, more norepinephrine can be recycled. More of it can be returned to the storage vesicle and therefore more can be released into the synapse. The second mechanism for drugs that can increase norepi in the synapse is number three, which would be releasers of norepinephrine. A classic example of this, amphetamines. Amphetamines cause the release of norepinephrine from the neuron. They actually enhance the norepinephrine that's in the mobile pool to return to the vesicle and cause its release. So amphetamines are classified as releasers of norepinephrine. Our third mechanism to increase norepi in the synapse would be to block the reuptake of norepinephrine into the presynaptic nerve. You should think of a couple of types of drugs here. Your tricyclic antidepressants block reuptake. So does cocaine. Cocaine and TCAs, by blocking the reuptake of norepinephrine into the presynaptic nerve, will increase the amount of norepinephrine in the synapse. To some extent, amphetamines can also block this pump. They're major releasers of norepinephrine, but amphetamines may also contribute to that mechanism by blocking reuptake. On the other side, let's discuss drugs that are going to decrease the amount of norepinephrine in the synapse. There are several of these that we can look at. Labeled as number one would be the drug methyl P-tyrosine. It's a drug that competes with and blocks tyrosine hydroxylase. It competes with tyrosine because obviously methyl P-tyrosine is a tyrosine derivative. By inhibiting this rate limiting step, you decrease the synthesis and obviously the release of norepinephrine into the synapse. A second mechanism shown by number five would be alpha-2 agonists and antagonists. If you used an alpha-2 agonist, Drugs like clonidine or methyl dopa, those drugs would stimulate alpha-2 receptors. They would enhance the negative feedback mechanism of that receptor and cause the inhibition of norepinephrine release. On the other hand, if you used an alpha-2 antagonist, if you block that negative feedback mechanism, this nerve will continue to release norepinephrine. So a way to decrease norepi in the synapse would be to stimulate that alpha-2 receptor. I suppose we can add alpha-2 antagonist to drugs that can actually increase norepi in the synapse. Number six is where the drug reserpine is going to work. Reserpine works by destroying the storage vesicle. It damages and possibly destroys the vesicle, thereby depleting this neuron of norepinephrine. Obviously, that's going to decrease the amount of norepinephrine in the synapse. Number seven is how the drug guanethidine works. It blocks exocytosis. The drug can get inside this nerve, preventing the vesicle from migrating to the membrane, blocking the fusion and therefore blocking the release of norepinephrine. In fact, guanethidine's mechanism is analogous to a drug that we covered earlier, which was botulinum toxin. That toxin inhibited the release of acetylcholine. Of course, number eight tells us that we have a number of agonists or antagonists of various alpha and beta receptors, and those will all be discussed later on in this chapter. We want to look at this table listing the different adrenergic receptors. We'll start with the alphas and specifically focus on alpha-1 receptors. Perhaps the first thing that you notice, that alpha-1 receptors are found in lots of places. That's true. Alpha-1s are found in lots of different organs in the body. It's one of the most common adrenergic receptors. So when I look at the list, what I first want you to focus on are the three organs where we use alpha-1 and its effects. Let's start with the eye. This is a must-know, that stimulating alpha-1s in the eye 
are going to stimulate the radial muscle to contract, leading to madriasis. If you stop and think about that effect clinically, we've already discussed that you can use an alpha-1 agonist for a dilated eye exam. You get madriasis without cycloplegia. Next, we have blood vessels. Arterials and veins contain alpha-1 receptors. When I stimulate them, I'm going to vasoconstrict, increasing TPR, increasing blood pressure. So if I think about the use clinically, many times we focus on the patient with hypertension. But what if you had a patient with hypotension? Clearly that person might benefit from the use of fluids. Giving them fluids to increase their blood pressure, that could certainly help but so could an alpha-1 agonist to vasoconstrict and increase their blood pressure. On the other hand, if you were dealing with a patient with hypertension, an alpha-1 antagonist would be useful because of its vasodilating properties. The third organ that I want you to focus on for alpha-1s, notice focus specifically on the prostate. The prostatic urethra contains alpha-1 receptors. When I stimulate alpha-1s, I will contract, leading to urine retention. Now, when I have you focus on the prostate, obviously I'm having you to think about the condition of BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. So what type of drug would you use to treat BPH? If stimulating alpha-1s contracts and inhibits urination, obviously an alpha-1 antagonist would relax the prostate and increase urination. You should always think about both sides of that scenario. Not only what type of drug would be beneficial for BPH, but also what type of drug could actually worsen the symptoms of BPH. You should understand that that would be an alpha-1 agonist that can make that situation worse. There clearly are other organs listed here that we're not going to spend any time on. In fact, I will point about the kidney. When you look at the kidney and decreased renin release, this is not going to be a major focus for us, but it will be a point of, of comparison as we talk about what's going on with beta-1 receptors in just a few moments. Let's move on to alpha-2 receptors. Alpha-2s are found in a limited number of locations. The most important of these is presynaptic nerve terminals. The role of that alpha-2 is a negative feedback receptor. When you stimulate alpha-2, as we saw in the previous diagram, you inhibit the release of norepinephrine. But alpha-2s are also found on platelets, where stimulating them causes platelet aggregation. They're also found on beta cells of the pancreas. Alpha-2, in fact, is the predominant adrenergic receptor found on beta cells. When I stimulate alpha-2s, I will decrease insulin secretion. Next, we will look at beta-1 receptors. Beta-1 receptors are found on the heart. In fact, found throughout the heart. They're found on the nodes, the SA and AV node. They're found on atrial and ventricular muscle, and also in the his Purkinje fibers. When you think about the actions of stimulating beta-1s, we describe the increase in heart rate as a positive chronotropic effect. We describe the increase in conduction velocity as a positive dromotropic effect. We also describe the action on the muscle with the increased force of contraction as a positive inotropic effect. Clearly a beta blocker would do the opposite, give you negative chronotropic, dromotropic, and negative inotropic effects if you're using a beta blocker. Now while most folks are aware that beta-1 receptors are found on the heart, make sure that you remember that beta-1s are also found in the kidney. They're found on JGA cells where stimulating beta-1s causes renin release. Don't forget the other action of beta-1s on the kidney. In fact, what if you got a question that asked you about this? It asked for a drug that would specifically inhibit sympathetic-induced renin release. How do you stop sympathetic-induced renin release? You understand how the sympathetic nervous system causes renin release, and that's through activation of beta-1s. How do you stop that? Block beta-1s. That's what the question was calling for. You were looking for a beta-1 blocker to stop sympathetic-induced renin release.
When we look at beta-2 receptors, there's a couple of points that you need to highlight right at the very beginning. First, it's that most beta-2s are not innervated. Since they're not innervated, that means that norepinephrine is not their primary activator. It's epinephrine. Epi activates beta-2s because epi from the adrenal medulla is released into the circulation. Circulating epi can find those non-innervated beta-2s and stimulate them. When I look at the different organs that contain beta-2 receptors, let's look at the first three together, blood vessels, uterus, and the bronchioles, because the theme is all going to be the same. If I stimulate a beta-2 on smooth muscle, what is going to happen to that smooth muscle? If I increase cyclic AMP, the smooth muscle will relax. Blood vessels vasodilate. The uterus relaxes. The lungs, the smooth muscle relaxes, causing bronchodilation. So stimulating beta-2s drops your blood pressure due to the vasodilating action. Of course, we've already learned that could lead to a reflex tachycardia. On the uterus, you can give a beta-2 agonist to inhibit labor. If you want to stop contractions, beta-2 agonists relax the uterus. And of course, on the lungs, stimulating beta-2s to bronchodilate is useful for asthma or COPD. Then we have skeletal muscle. You know, I would ask you this question. If you're in a fight or flight situation, what are your blood vessels doing? Are they constricting or are they dilating? Or is that kind of a trick question? Because really it's a trick question. In a fight or flight type situation, some vessels are constricting while others are dilating. It's an easy question if you say, where do you want the blood to go during fight or flight? Because definitely blood going to your skeletal muscles would be beneficial. Whether you're going to run or stand and fight, you need more blood to the skeletal muscle. So the blood vessels that supply skeletal muscle are full of beta-2 receptors, and those vessels dilate in response to sympathetic stimulation. But what do you want the blood to do to other non-essential organs during fight or flight? You want those blood vessels to constrict. So most of your internal organs have lots of alpha-1 receptors, and they're constricting during that same time. That shunts the blood away from those organs. Your, your intestinal tract does not need a lot of blood flow during fight or flight. Those vessels constrict in favor of the blood being shunted to your skeletal muscle. So it's important to note blood vessels of skeletal muscle certainly have a lot of beta 2s. But the next point I'm going to make is strictly about skeletal muscle itself. We have seen earlier that skeletal muscle, innervated by somatic motor nerves, contains nicotinic N sub M receptors. Now I'm going to remind you that skeletal muscle also has beta-2 receptors. That's right, there are beta-2s on your skeletal muscle. How could this show up in a question? What if you had an asthmatic, and you told that asthmatic to take a beta-2 agonist as needed, one to two puffs, but perhaps your asthmatic doesn't follow instructions well, and instead of going with one to two puffs, they go with, let's say, eight to ten puffs. If they use that drug excessively, a drug that was designed because of the inhaler to go specifically to the lungs is now going systemic. Systemic administration of a beta-2 agonist might manifest with a skeletal muscle tremor. That's an important side effect to note. Why does the skeletal muscle contract and turn into a tremor? It's because your skeletal muscle contains beta-2 receptors. You would also want to note some of the metabolic effects that beta-2 receptors are involved in. Beta-2s are found on the liver and on the pancreas. Notice in, in each of these cases, whether it's skeletal muscle, liver, or pancreas, you're going to get a metabolic action. On skeletal muscle and liver, you see an increase in glycogenolysis. This is the primary action of beta-2 activation to increase blood glucose. On the pancreas, there are beta-2 receptors on beta cells. They're not as numerous as alpha-2 receptors on the pancreas. So remember earlier, we said alpha-2 is the predominant adrenergic receptor on the pancreas, and it causes a decrease in insulin secretion.
the key question to, to answer here is, what does beta-2 activation do to blood glucose? And the answer is it's going to increase blood glucose. Again, that main effect is through skeletal muscle and liver activation, the pancreas being a less important effect. On the other hand, what does blocking beta-2 receptors result in? If I block beta-2s, the organs that are primarily affected, again, are skeletal muscle and liver, and therefore blood glucose will decrease. That's an important concept for non-selective beta blocker overdose because I'm going to see low blood glucose in those situations. We've also got dopamine D1 receptors listed in this table. D1 receptors are especially found on renal blood vessels. Let's focus on those. You get renal vasodilation when you stimulate D1 receptors. That's going to increase renal blood flow and GFR, also increasing sodium excretion. There's a couple of notes in the margin that we want to pay attention to related to dopamine. The first note is this, that if I use dopamine, it's going to have dose-dependent effects on different receptors. You see the arrow? It shows you that the lower doses of dopamine will stimulate D1 receptors, and I will get renal vasodilation. That's why low-dose dopamine has been referred to as the renal dose. If I give a medium dose of dopamine, referred to as the cardiac dose, I will stimulate beta-1 receptors, and that's why dopamine can be used in certain cases of congestive heart failure for its positive inotropic effects. However, if I give dopamine in a high enough level, I will stimulate alpha-1 receptors to vasoconstrict, increasing TPR and blood pressure. So to summarize, the dose-dependent effects of dopamine happen on D1 first, then beta-1, and then alpha-1. It's reverse alphabetical, and it's always betas before alphas. We have a D1 agonist called phenoldepam. Phenoldepam can be used in severe hypertension or hypertensive emergencies. It's a powerful vasodilator that works specifically through D1 receptors to have that effect. In the margin is another note called, in a nutshell, about adrenergic receptor sensitivity. This note reminds us that beta receptors tend to respond before alpha receptors. Another way to say that is that it's beta before alpha. If I were to use, let's say, epinephrine, and I gave epinephrine at a low dose, I'm going to see beta effects, beta 1 and beta 2. But at high doses, that's when epinephrine will give me the alpha responses. So this is consistent with what we just discussed with dopamine. It's also true for epinephrine, betas before alphas. This table looks at our mechanisms used by the adrenergic receptors. We've discussed that alpha-1s are GQ, alpha-2s are GI. We know that all betas are GS, and it happens that D1s, one of those oddballs, D1s are also GS. But you know, sometimes you don't just have to memorize things. You can simply understand. When I think of D1 in the periphery, I think about renal blood vessels, and those blood vessels are going to dilate. That's because the smooth muscle is relaxing. What type of G protein is associated with relaxing smooth muscle? It's GS. That's the same thing that happens when you stimulate beta 2s on smooth muscle. So let's take a look at our direct acting adrenergic agonists. And we'll start specifically with the alpha 1 agonist. The prototype drug here is phenylephrine. It's really the one and only one alpha 1 agonist that you have to be familiar with, so make sure you know this drug. We see an example of a cardiovascular trace where we administer phenylephrine. Remember, when we look at a diagram like this, prior to the arrow, that's our control. That's normal blood pressure and normal heart rate. Now, when I give phenylephrine, can you predict? In fact, couldn't you draw this diagram yourself? Sure you could. When I give a vasoconstrictor like phenylephrine, TPR and blood pressure are going to go up, so you notice how the trace migrates up. But when the blood pressure goes up, what happens next? The autonomic nervous system kicks in to control that increase in blood pressure, 
it's going to cause a reflex bradycardia. Especially as I look to the far right of this diagram, the heart rate has slowed quite a bit. Now that reflex bradycardia was mediated by what receptor? Remember, it's happening because the parasympathetic nervous system fired to the heart. And when you fire parasympathetics to the heart, you stimulate muscarinic M2 receptors. It's an M2-mediated reflex bradycardia. You know, when I look at diagrams like this, these can show up on your step one exam. But a variation of this diagram can also show up. It's what I call multiple traces. Instead of combining blood pressure and heart rate into the same diagram, what if they separated blood pressure from heart rate and just drew those as single lines? For example, blood pressure, maybe it's mean blood pressure represented as a single line. At the arrow, that mean blood pressure should migrate up. If it's phenylephrine and I saw a single line representing heart rate, when I give phenylephrine at the arrow, there wouldn't be an immediate change in the heart rate because reflexes are always going to take a little bit of time to occur. So there will be a short period of time where the heart rate would stay the same and then the heart rate would go down. That's characteristic of a reflex effect is a slight time delay. My strategy for you is this. Always look at TPR or blood pressure before you look at heart rate or cardiac output. This is a specially important strategy when you're looking at this type of problem or when you're looking at a table with numbers, with information that you have to decipher. When you need to decide exactly how to use that information, look at the blood vessel before you look at the heart. The text reminds us what an alpha-1 agonist is going to do. Simply, it's going to vasoconstrict to increase the blood pressure that increase causes a reflex bradycardia. Let's focus on the drug phenylephrine. Phenylephrine is used as a nasal decongestant. It's also used for dilated eye exams because it causes madriasis without cycloplegia. Many times we see phenylephrine used together with a muscarinic antagonist for those dilated eye exams. You might remember several years ago, a very, very popular nasal decongestant called pseudoephedrine was pulled out of many of those over-the-counter products. That's because folks were taking the pseudoephedrine and making methamphetamine out of that. So those products were replaced with an older decongestant called phenylephrine. When we changed the labeling on those products, we put the letters PE on there to indicate that we had added phenylephrine to that product. How about if we take the letters PE Perhaps that's an abbreviation you could use for phenylephrine and use that to help us remember a couple of organs that can be affected by this drug. Phenylephrine is going to affect the prostate and the eyes because, of course, those are organs that contain alpha-1 receptors. If you add the third organ, which would be blood vessels, you've just reviewed a table that we covered earlier. Next, we have alpha-2 agonists. But we're only going to briefly review these drugs now because they're covered in much more detail in our cardiovascular section. The two drugs we list here are clonidine and methyl dopa, which can be used in hypertension. The way that I use to remember these two drugs, it's kind of a variation on what I would call the most famous equation of all time. Now, you can disagree with me, but you're probably wrong. That Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, is the most famous equation of all time but let's modify it so we can use it in pharmacology. Let's change it to alpha equals mc squared, because there's my alpha 2 and the two drugs, m, methyl dopa, and c for clonidine. Next, we're going to look at our beta agonist. We're going to start by looking at a drug that can stimulate both beta 1 and beta 2 receptors. When we look at the cardiovascular trace, focus on the blood pressure first. Notice how the mean blood pressure goes down. That is your beta-2 vasodilating effect to decrease TPR and blood pressure. But also immediately at the arrow, we see an increase in the heart rate. That's your beta-1 mediated tachycardia. But here's something that we haven't discussed up to this point. Do you notice also that this drug causes an increase in the pulse pressure? 
pulse pressure remembers the difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure. The drug, once it's administered, causes a widening of that difference there between systolic and diastolic, resulting in an increase in the pulse pressure. If you break it down, you notice that the diastolic pressure decreases more than the systolic pressure. Let's see if we can explain why. Why does this type of drug increase the pulse pressure? Well, a shortcut would be to remember any time I see a graph where there's an increase in pulse pressure. That is caused by beta-1 activation. Beta-1 receptors being stimulated increase the pulse pressure. And the reason is, stimulating beta-1s has a significant effect on stroke volume. And as a result, the systolic pressure does not decrease very much in this case. However, the diastolic pressure continues to go down. The net effect is an increase in our pulse pressure caused by activation of beta-1 receptors. When we look at the different beta agonists, we start with the drug isoproteranol. If I remember the prefix iso means same, iso means the same. This drug isoproteranol has the same action on beta-1 as it does on beta-2. So it's a beta-1, beta-2 agonist. Dobutamine, however, is much more beta-1 selective. So we consider this drug for cases of heart failure where we want the specific beta-1 positive inotropic effect. We also have selective beta-2 agonists. Albuterol is our prototype, but other drugs like salmuterol or terbutalin can be used in asthma and perhaps also in COPD. The drug terbutalin we see used in premature labor, taking advantage of stimulating beta-2s, relaxing the uterus. Next, let's look at our mixed-acting adrenergic agonist. This would be norepinephrine and epinephrine. Now, these are pretty fun to look at because they're going to work on multiple receptors. Let's start with norepinephrine. If you had to describe the profile, the receptor profile for norepinephrine, you would say alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1. But why not beta-2? That's because beta-2s are not innervated, so norepinephrine is not their activator. When I look at this cardiovascular trace, the trace is really going to be a reflection of two of these three receptors. It's going to reflect the action of norepinephrine on alpha-1 and beta-1. But I will really never see an alpha-2 effect in this type of diagram. Let me try to explain why. Alpha-2s are found presynaptically. They're found on nerves, whereas alpha-1s and beta-1s are found on the organs themselves. If I stimulate an alpha-2 and I inhibit the nerve from releasing norepinephrine, obviously that's an important effect, but the drug that I'm giving is norepinephrine. So what I'm going to see is the effects of norepi on the organs. I will see norepi directly stimulating alpha-1s and directly stimulating beta-1s. I see the organ effects, not the presynaptic effects in an experiment. So when I give norepinephrine at the arrow, do you notice the blood pressure goes up? What receptor caused that effect? Well, that was alpha-1 vasoconstriction increasing TPR, thereby increasing blood pressure. At the arrow, I see an immediate beta-1 effect to increase the heart rate. So initially, it's alpha-1 and beta-1. But folks, what happened on the far right side of my diagram? In particular, what happened to the heart rate? Do you notice that I got a bradycardia? Why did that occur? It occurred because the blood pressure was increased. The alpha-1 vasoconstriction increasing the blood pressure caused a reflex bradycardia. A reflex bradycardia. So what receptor mediated the bradycardia? It happens when the parasympathetic nervous system fires to the heart and stimulates muscarinic M2s. If I were to summarize the net effect of norepinephrine on the heart rate, here's what I would say. The net effect is to increase the heart rate initially, but to decrease it more long term. In other words, the reflex overcomes the direct effect. Do you remember what we covered earlier? If you ever have a choice between the heart and the blood vessels, remember, 
the blood vessels always win. Drugs that change the blood vessel will end up controlling the heart, just like we see here. The reflex overcame the direct effect. Norepinephrine also lends itself to a great test question. Because what if it said, prior to the administration of norepinephrine, the patient was given a ganglion blocker? Tell me how the ganglion blocker would change this trace. Would it affect norepi's ability to stimulate alpha-1s? No. Alpha-1s would still vasoconstrict. TPR and blood pressure would increase. Would the ganglion blocker stop norepinephrine from stimulating beta-1s? It would not. Beta-1s are on the heart. Norepi directly stimulates them to cause tachycardia. The part of the diagram that would change is the far right side. The ganglion blocker blocks reflexes. Therefore, in the presence of a ganglion blocker, I would expect that the blood pressure stays up and the heart rate stays up. That would be a very important type of experiment to make sure you understand so that you can get it right on exam day. Since we've covered norepinephrine, let's move on and discuss epinephrine. Let's start with its receptor profile. The receptors that epi will stimulate are alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. Clearly that's the important part here. Beta-2 effects of epi distinguish it from norepinephrine. But epi has dose-dependent effects. We compare that as low, medium, and high doses. Let's start at the top with low-dose epinephrine. Have you seen this type of profile before? If you look at the shape of this graph, it is identical to what we covered earlier for a beta-1, beta-2 agonist. It's identical to the actions of isoproteranol. So let's make that as our summary. Low-dose epi looks just like isoproteranol. In fact, if you ever get a test question and you analyze the results of an experiment and you decide, well, that's a beta-1, beta-2 agonist, perhaps your first thought is, well, it's got to be isoproteranol. But when you look, isoproteranol is not an option. Come up with a second option. Low-dose epinephrine can do exactly the same thing. In the middle, we can look at medium-dose epinephrine. Medium dose is the transition between beta effects and alpha effects. We start to see some alpha-1 vasoconstriction, but we still have beta-2 vasodilation, so those two tend to offset each other. In fact, medium dose epinephrine doesn't make for a good test question. Focus on low dose and then compare that to high dose. If you go to the bottom of the page and you look at high dose epinephrine. High dose epi is going to be very alpha-like. I'm certainly going to see alpha-1 vasoconstriction, increasing TPR and blood pressure. I do see an initial beta-1 effect to increase the heart rate, but shortly I see an, that action is overcome by a reflex bradycardia. You have actually seen this diagram before as well. On the previous slide, this is exactly what norepinephrine did. Alpha-1 and beta-1, but ultimately, any direct effects on the heart were overcome by a reflex. So high-dose epi looks the same as norepinephrine. In a test question, it's very, very possible you will be asked to distinguish high-dose epi from norepinephrine. We will cover that in just a few moments. Since epinephrine has some beta-2 specific effects, smooth muscle relaxation on the lungs, the uterus, and blood vessels, it also has some metabolic effects to increase glycogenolysis. As we saw in an earlier table, that's an action on skeletal muscle and liver. Stimulating beta-2s can also increase gluconeogenesis. So the beta-2 effects here all can increase blood glucose. Stimulating beta-2s can also increase the mobilization and the use of fat, increasing the level of fatty acids, and together with increased glucose can provide you with energy, for example, in a fight-or-flight situation. The actions of epinephrine on beta-2 receptors are the opposite of what you see from insulin 
working on insulin receptors. Isn't it true that insulin is a storage hormone? Insulin wants you to store nutrients and epinephrine wants you to utilize those nutrients, especially in times of fight or flight. So you might be asked to distinguish high dose epi from norepinephrine. The way you distinguish is you look for a thing called epinephrine reversal. The way that I want to explain this is I want to have you compare epi to norepinephrine. And let's start with norepinephrine. If I give norepinephrine, the blood pressure should increase. That's because norepi stimulates alpha-1 to vasoconstrict. The pressure goes up, and therefore if I give an alpha-1 blocker, I would expect that the pressure would return to normal. Now that's what happens with norepinephrine. How is that different with high-dose epinephrine? If I give high-dose epinephrine, I stimulate alpha-1 receptors to vasoconstrict. TPR and blood pressure go up. Now, what if I give an alpha-1 blocker? Does the blood pressure go back to normal? Or does the blood pressure go low? The answer is the blood pressure goes below normal. Why is it that epinephrine can cause you to go from a hypertensive state to a hypotensive state, but norepinephrine could not? That's because of epi's ability to stimulate beta-2 receptors. When I block the alpha-1s, it's almost as if epinephrine says, that's fine, I will stimulate the betas, including beta-2, causing vasodilation and dropping the blood pressure. The key to this experiment and the key to differentiating high-dose epi from norepi is to look at the part of the experiment that has an alpha-1 blocker present. If the alpha-1 blocker returns the pressure to normal, that was norepinephrine. But if the alpha-1 blocker, you see the pressure go low, hypertension to hypotension, that is epinephrine reversal. There are various uses of norepinephrine and epinephrine. For example, cardiac arrest. We can use them as an adjunct to local anesthetics. Primarily, we're going to use epinephrine for this purpose, and we combine epi with a local anesthetic because of its vasoconstrictive properties, keeping that local anesthetic localized. We can use norepinephrine in hypotension. It's going to consistently vasoconstrict and increase the blood pressure. Epinephrine is the drug of choice for anaphylaxis. If you think about that, if the anaphylaxis is mediated by histamine, can you identify what type of antagonism that is? If epinephrine is opposing the actions of histamine, is that pharmacologic, physiologic, or chemical antagonism? Do you remember the trick? Count your receptors. Histamine has its own receptor. Epinephrine has its own receptor, and the two receptors oppose each other. This is a great example of physiologic antagonism. So, for example, epinephrine has a great ability to oppose histamine's action on the lungs. We love epi for its beta-2 effects to bronchodilate, and that's very important as a part of your treatment for anaphylaxis. In fact, thinking of the lungs, that's why epi would be used over, norepi, over norepinephrine in the treatment of asthma. We don't typically do that anymore, but epinephrine could be useful, again, because of its beta-2 bronchodilating effects. Our next group of drugs are called indirect acting adrenergic receptor agonists. The word here that really catches my attention is the word indirect. That's a real key as to how these drugs are working because indirect means that they're not actually stimulating adrenergic receptors. In fact, these drugs are actually working on presynaptic nerves. We have seen many of them earlier in the diagram on page 55. So that's a good reference for this part of our notes. When we think about releasers, here's something that we really haven't discussed in much detail yet, and it's tyramine. Tyramine, remember, is a molecule found in various foods and beverages, such as red wine and cheese. Tyramine is normally metabolized by monoamine oxidase type A. So that's why if you drink red wine, for example, and get exposed to tyramine, you don't get much of an effect 
from the tyramine because of its rapid metabolism by this enzyme. When does tyramine cause a problem? Another way to say that is when does it show up on the test? If you have a patient taking a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, now all of a sudden you can't metabolize tyramine. And in this situation, tyramine can act just like an amphetamine. It can cause the release of norepinephrine from adrenergic nerves, and that can result in a hypertensive crisis. It's rare. It's fatal. It's definitely something to watch out for on exam day. If you put a patient on an MAOI, you have to caution them about foods and beverages that contain tyramine. In the margin is a note called In a Nutshell that reviews the different forms of monoamine oxidase. There's a type A and a type B. An easy way to remember is A can stand for anywhere because type A is found really all over the body. It's mainly in the liver, but it's found in lots of other places as well. It's type A that metabolizes norepinephrine, serotonin, and tyramine. Type B is more limited in its locations. Remember B for brain. You primarily find type B in the brain where it metabolizes dopamine. Now let's think about this for a moment. There's a drug that we will cover in a later lecture called selegiline. Selegiline is specific for inhibiting MAO-B. So if it inhibits type B, it's going to increase the amount of dopamine. Can't you automatically think about what that drug would be useful for? Who needs more dopamine? Patients with Parkinson's. That's what selegiline is used for. But it's specific for type B. Can you predict, will selegiline interact with tyramine? And the answer is no. Selegiline is specific for type B, while tyramine is metabolized by MAOA. So the types of monoamine oxidase inhibitors that would interact with tyramine would be those that especially inhibit type A. Also among the list of releasers of norepinephrine are amphetamines, including the drug methylphenidate. Methylphenidate is very popular in the treatment of ADHD, and amphetamines are also used in narcolepsy. Amphetamines cause the release not only of norepinephrine, but perhaps also of dopamine and even serotonin. Another releaser is ephedrine. Formerly very popular as a cold medication in the form of pseudoephedrine. This is the drug, again, that was used to make methamphetamine. But pseudoephedrine has been replaced in most of our products by phenylephrine as the most common nasal decongestant today. Also in the category of indirect acting agonist are the reuptake inhibitors cocaine and TCAs. These are drugs that block the reuptake of norepinephrine into the presynaptic nerve, thereby increasing the amount of norepinephrine in the synapse. And that explains the stimulant-like effect that these drugs can give you. Once again, reference page 55 for these actions that we've reviewed earlier. In the margin is a note called Classic Clue, and it reminds us, if you're an indirect acting adrenergic agonist, you're only going to work on innervated tissues. In other words, if you have a denervated system, if you're lacking the nerve, if you don't have an adrenergic nerve, none of these drugs are going to work. So if we did that experimentally, if we experimentally removed the adrenergic nerve, or if you're dealing with a non innervated adrenergic receptor like most beta 2s, none of these drugs in the middle of the page called indirect agonists will have an effect on that tissue. Let me give you this hint. If you ever get an experimental type of test question where you're comparing two drugs, one of those drugs is a direct acting agonist. Maybe it's a drug that works directly on alpha 1 receptors. But the second drug, let's say is a drug like cocaine. That's an indirect acting agonist. Be very careful with that type of question. Anytime I compare a direct agonist to an indirect agonist, that is very likely to be a denervation question. Where what I'm doing is I'm comparing what happens if I have the nerve versus what happens without the nerve. And here's how that experiment is going to go. 
In the first part, both drugs can activate the organ. But in the second part, where something has happened during that time, only the direct agonist continues to work, and the indirect agonist does not do anything. The question will ask you, what has happened between experiment one and experiment two? You know the answer is, the nerve has been removed.